Ask. Do husbands promise their wives things? Do parents promise their children things? Do friends promise other friends things? Do colleagues at work promise each other things? Right? Now, a promise, simply put, is a declaration of assurance. Because when you say, oh, I will do this for you, and the person, are you sure? You say, I promise. Because a synonym of the word promise is pledge. That is the reason why he says it's a declaration of what? Assurance. It's a pledge. It's a guarantee. It's a surety. It's a security. Spoken security. So, the first meaning he says is a declaration of assurance that one will do something or that a particular thing will happen. Do you make promises? Do you keep all your promises? Do people make promises to you? Do they keep all their promises? So do we get disappointed many times? Thank you. And when you get disappointed, what happens to your trust in that person's word? Okay. Two. A promise. It says, it says, to assure someone, see, it's the same thing, but just a different way of putting it, to assure someone that one will definitely do something or that something will happen. Is it the same thing? Same thing, but said differently. You know, and, you know the dictionary does that so that you can understand the force behind the meaning. It says, to assure someone that one will definitely do something or that something will happen. Let me quickly go to the third one. To give good grounds for expecting a particular occurrence. To give good grounds for doing what? Expecting a particular occurrence. Occurrence. To give good grounds. So a promise is therefore like unto a foundation that I can stand to expect that something is about to happen. Are you still here with me? And it's good ground because a promise gives assurance. A promise gives assurance. A promise is like bond. Another way to say I, 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 I make a promise is that I give you my word. Am I right? Yeah, I give you my word. So if God says, focus on my promises, is it not another way of saying focus on my word? The words that I have done what? Spoken unto you? Right? So I, I, I'm sure you're all following this. So, hey, if I make a declaration to you right now that the service is going to end in five minutes and I tell you, I promise you, I will keep it. Now, if I said, well, I hope that it will happen in, you know, it will probably end soon. That is vague. 
right? Um, sometimes I say things like, oh, well, today's message will be rather short. Is that true? And it ends up being long. Now, that wasn't a promise. You get that? It wasn't a promise. It was, I was just declaring an expectation because it's an expectation even on my own part. So it is different from when somebody says, I promise you. I promise you. But look at this. With God, there is no, I'm declaring expectation or I'm just saying it. God doesn't just say. No, no, no. I don't know if you're getting this. With me, I can just say. You understand what I'm trying to get you to see? But with God, even when God is laughing and he's just saying something, it's a promise. Are you still here with me? When God is angry and he makes a declaration, it's a promise. So whatever, wherever, however, God declares a thing, whatever he says is a promise. Are you here with me? So with God, you can his word. You can rest on his word. And so we need to understand what a promise is so that we can understand what God's promises are. He made a promise to Satan. Has he kept that word? Yeah. Because on the cross, the Bible says that he disarmed principalities and powers and made what? A public spectacle of them. Triumphing over them in it. And stripped him of all... In 1 John chapter 3, it says that he, the Son of God, came that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, the coming of Jesus, was it the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Satan? So understand this. God made a promise to Satan. Did God keep his word? Is Satan defeated? Now, then he also made a promise to liberate mankind. And when Jesus came and rose from the dead and he was confronted with Mary, what did he say to Mary after their little encounter? He said, go tell your brethren that I send unto my father and, and theirs. That's another way of saying, now you, can be, you, are, you, are, you now have a title or a right to become sons of God. Not just my disciples or my friends, but I have often told you, my father, my father, my father. You have said, show us the father. Now you can enter into the courts of the father. Are you following? I'm trying to help you see. So he fulfilled his promise to Satan and fulfilled his promise to mankind. And the promise to mankind is that he will bless them. And the blessing of the gospel is the remission of sin, the removal of sin. Now, when you say the removal of sin, people don't understand what you're talking about. Removal of sin is different from forgiveness. There was forgiveness in the Old Testament, but there was no removal of sin. Are you still here? And so, they had to renew their contract of forgiveness every year. So for them, the blood of bulls and goats covered their sins. And this is the reason why we say to you, because God kept his promise, you are not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because to say that you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ is to limit the power of that blood. Is to say that the blood is not more potent than the blood of animals. Are you following this? Because the blood of animals do, does what? Covers. But underneath the blood, what do you have? Sins, transgressions, iniquities. 
But the Bible says that when Jesus came, he says he made a new and living way by which we will enter into the throne of grace. And that which the blood of bulls and goats could not do, the blood of the Lamb, the precious Lamb of God, accomplished it. What was that? It removed sin from mankind. And the, the removal of sin, or the circumcision, as you heard yesterday, of sin, that removal of sin leaves no sin beneath because there is nothing like above the blood or beneath the blood with the blood of Christ what you have and that's what the Bible says when the blood of Jesus is applied upon you the blood of Jesus does not cover you it washes you there's a difference so it is not hiding the dirt it takes the dirt away blots it out and separates you from your sins as far as the east is from the west. East and west are on the same line. Are you following this? And so what God does, please come. This is my sin. Sorry. My sin. So we're married. We're one. And because of this, I had no fellowship with God. Under the old covenant, it was covered. So filtered through that blood, God could hear me. Right? With Christ, this is what God did. And the blood came in between. And sent it in one direction. And sent me where? In another direction. Are you following this? So I am cut away from my sin. Now, when God says to bless, this is a huge blessing. Because you see, the separation of my sin from me means that Satan no longer has any authority over me. Because the only authority that he had over me was sin. Are you still here with me? So now I'm free from sin. Now that I have no sin nature, what's left of me? Not just innocence, but righteousness. And so he made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now look, becoming the righteousness of God in Christ is, okay, I've, I've used the right word. It is becoming. You become the righteousness of God in Christ. The righteousness of God in Christ is not about doing. It is about being. It's about who I am. What I have become in Christ is the righteousness of God in Christ. That becomes my nature. The doing part of righteousness is what the Bible refers to in Romans chapter 9, uh, sorry, Revelations 19, as the garment that was put upon the bride that made herself ready for the coming of the Lord. And it says, oh, and that garment is the righteousness of the saints. Their deeds. So I do because of what I have become. I am, and I live it out. Amen. To bless. He kept his promise. But few of us have entered into this promise. It's just not about joining a church, a good church. There are people who probably are in heritage assembly who are not born by the Spirit of God. They have not received this blessing, but they are amongst us. So it's not about being in the fellowship of the, of the saints. That is, joining the gathering of the saints. No. There's a process to becoming a member of this church. There's a process to becoming a member of his church. 
I'm trying to make a distinction between the physical gathering of the saints and the spiritual house of God. Are you still here with me? And the Bible says he has saved by grace through faith. It is by faith that we enter into this provision. The promise of God. An assurance was given by God and God kept his word. I could stop here, but I'm not going to. I want to expatiate a little bit on something I said early on. That when we consider God's promise or promises, what should we see? It's the same thing as when you consider a promise. There are two major aspects to it. When anyone makes a promise to you, before you believe it, two things run through your mind in an instant. The first is, can the person perform this promise? Am I right? Let us say that a woman gets up and comes to a key and says, you see, I, I, I have administration in my spirit, you know, I just, uh, uh, the Lord has told me that before the end of the evening, I should give you a million dollars. She's laughing. <laughs> that one belief to the call. <laughs> Why? Because <laughs> you already know that he does not have that ability to to perform, right? So you consider the ability to perform. Is he able? Now, if he is able, there is something else that you would then consider. So there are two, two things that you tick when you hear a promise. First, does this fellow have the ability to, to perform this promise? Second, is this person trustworthy? Am I right? Yeah, is he trustworthy? I can, he can. But he won't. He can, but he may. What does that mean? That he has the ability to perform it first, but he won't do it, right? The second, he has the ability to perform it, but he may do it. When there is a maybe, then there is a trust issue. Is he trustworthy? He can. And he will. Then you go to rest. Are you following this? What follows when you come to that conviction? That one, he can. Two, he will. What follows? Expectation. Am I right? There's an expectation. Because you know... The promiser, I'm using this loosely, can and will. So what follows that is an expectation. And when, where there is an expectation, then there is a preparation to enter into the provision. Are you with me? Are you with me? So let us find out from the word of God, if God can, right? And if he will. 
Are you still here with me? What are we finding out? If God does what? If he can. And if he will. I know for the majority of us, we don't have a problem believing that God can. Our interactions with God limit us to the very second, not the first. He can, but he won't. No, we know, we know, we know, we don't, we don't think that of God. But we think the second of God. What is the second? He can and he may. So when we make our approach to God in prayers, we don't come with faith. We come uncertain. Will he? Will he not? But I've asked God for something else before. And this is about the third year. And nothing has happened. I've asked for 15 different things. I haven't seen the answer to any. This one, will he or will he not? So, when God says, focus on my promises, God is saying, throw away your unbelief and put on the garment of faith. Walk with me and enter into my supernatural provisions. That is the submission. 